I'm, I'm David Klinghoffer, and as you can tell, I hope you can tell, or maybe, well, I guess I hope you can't tell, my voice is not being amplified. So um, can everyone hear me at the back? Yes, no? Okay, I'm going to try to I'm gonna be very brief. I'm actually in the odd position. It's, it's the Jewish Sabbath, by the way, as Jay mentioned, which is why I'm not using a, a, It's the Jewish Sabbath, and that is why I'm not able to use a microphone. Um, and so I, I want to first of all thank Biola for being very accommodating of me on that point and a number of others. Um, they've made us feel, uh, a couple of Jewish friends who are with me today, very welcome, kosher food, uh, a place close enough to the campus uh, to sleep last night so I didn't have to walk too far uh, to be with you today. And that's great and I'm really grateful. I'm in the slightly odd position of introducing not another speaker but rather myself. <laughs> and I assure you that you can trust everything he says. We're, 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 <laughs> we're going to watch a brief um, clip that is uh, downloadable uh, later if you want, along with clips of other speakers today on the faithandevolution.org um, website. Uh, before, but before we do that, I, I want to mention two, uh, th two reasons why uh, our being here together, my being with you uh, as well, um, is fortuitous or one might even want to say providential. And one reason is the fact that it's the Sabbath itself. And it, interestingly, our, we have competition on campus today. I, as I was walking in at the chapel, there was a big sign with people going into the chapel and it said Sabbathing. Interesting. So, so that, there's some other event. I don't know what it is, but focused on, on the idea of the Sabbath. And of course, the reason that Jews and Christians observe a Sabbath, on, albeit on different days, is because in the fourth commandment, we read very clearly that God made the earth and the heavens and all that was in them, and he rested on the seventh day. And in the Torah, in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, says over and over again that the Sabbath is intended to be a sign and a reminder that the world has a creator, that the world is filled with purpose and intention, and one might even say to use modern language filled with design. And there are some commandments in the Bible whose relevance is to our, to our, to our contemporary lives is sometimes a little bit mysterious. There, there are other commandments uh, whose relevance becomes more clear over time. And the Sabbath is, I, I think, one of those. Part of the reason is that we live in this incredibly uh, busy, stressed world, far more so than our ancestors ever knew, and so the Sabbath is essential for that reason. But more relevant to our purposes here is that this lesson, this sign that the world has a creator that it is filled with purpose and design, is an idea that's obviously um, under attack. And we need um, a, a weekly uh, opportunity to think about that and to contemplate it. And one of the great things about Shabbat, about, about the Sabbath, and the fact that we don't use electricity is that when, when, you, when you don't use electronics, there's a, a sort of a quiet that descends. And you can hear it, you can hear it now. <laughs> and uh, and what, what, what's so great about quiet is that when it's quiet, you can hear things that you might not otherwise be able to hear. You know, at night, um, when, when all the lights are off and the house is quiet, you hear things like the, the, the refrigerator cycling on and off and on. You never hear that during the day, but at night, because it's quiet, you do hear it. And so this is a time that we can think about the meaning of creation, the meaning of, of design and purpose in the universe. The other reason I'll just say very briefly that this is providential, fortuitous, is that this particular Sabbath is, the, is um, the, the Torah reading for today is called Lech Lecha. Every Sabbath has a particular Torah reading associated with it. And today we read from Genesis 12 about Abraham and the first time that he ever heard God's voice speaking to him. And God said to him, Lech Lecha, go, leave your father's house, leave the land that, of your birth, and go to a land that I will show you. And it says right away that Abraham, of course, listened, and he took his family and he took his possessions. And it says uh, something very weird. It says he took the souls that he had made. Now, in many translations, it says the souls that he had acquired, and it's assumed to mean 
that he'd acquired slaves, but the Hebrew doesn't say acquire. There's a perfectly good Hebrew word for acquire. It says that he made them, Asu, he and, he and his wife made these souls. And what does that mean? Jewish tradition, the Midrash and the, the Aramaic translation, Ankalas of, of the Torah, and Maimonides later, are unanimous that it means that Abraham was an evangelist uh, creating converts to this new religion of primordial atheism. I'm, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> primordial monotheism. Excuse me. <laughs> but what's weird is that he was already apparently making these converts even before he ever heard God's voice. And he lived at a time when the world was devoid of the knowledge of God. So where did Abraham get his knowledge of God that he was able to go out and preach to people? What was, what was he preaching? And how did he know it? He had not heard it from God previous to that. And again, Jewish tradition is unanimous. All these ancient sources are unanimous in saying that Abraham arrived at his knowledge of God, the, the discover, his discovery of God, the title of a book that I wrote, uh, by contemplating nature. And that, this, is, this is said in, in, the, the, in the Midrash, uh, Genesis Rabbah, that goes back almost 2,000 years, that he, Abraham was someone who contemplated nature, and that is how he arrived at his knowledge of God. Now that was 3,767 years before the publication of The Origin of Species. For Abraham to arrive at that knowledge was one thing. For us to arrive at that knowledge and to keep it is something very different because we live in a time that is obviously very, very hostile to the idea that nature bears evidence, bears witness to the existence of the one God. So that's why we are here today on this Sabbath of Lech Lecha, the, the Sabbath that we, when we think about Abraham and I thank you very much for bearing with me, and I hope you're able to hear what I, what I said. You will be able to hear for sure what, what I say next, uh, which is on the video. We're going we're gonna to play that right now. And thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sometimes it's claimed that only Christians, fundamentalist Christians, this great bogeyman, have a problem with Darwinism. As a sociological matter, that's not true, and I, I say that as someone who knows the Orthodox Jewish community very well. Um, theologically, too, to the extent that Jews are aware of Jewish belief, uh, a Jew must have a problem with Darwinism. We are instructed over and over again um, for certainly in the Bible, in Jewish traditional texts, uh, institutions, for example, the Sabbath, about the centrality of the idea that nature and life reflects God's purpose and intent. Now, the Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath, is perhaps the most central and defining institution in Judaism. And the way that we inaugurate the Sabbath each Friday night is through a sanctification over a cup of wine. It's called Kiddush. And um, when we say the sanctification, we stand. The reason we stand is because in a Jewish court of law, a witness giving testimony stands. And what we're doing when we, when we begin the Sabbath, which is a commemoration of God's creativity in the universe, is we are giving testimony standing that the universe has a designer, if you will. And to deny, it, to deny that would be to deny um, the truth of our testimony each Sabbath. In, in Jewish theology, in Jewish religious life, debates are often a sort of a game of capture the flag, where everyone wants to cite the names of famous rabbis who agree with your position. And it's certainly true that you can find ample rabbinic um, uh, citations for the idea that the universe is, is not literally um, 6,000 years old. There, there, certainly there's ample support for that. But the idea that nature does not reflect God's creativity, there is no rabbinic source that, that is traditional and authentic to Judaism that would say anything like that. And if you speak about the great names of the Talmudic period, the medieval period, the modern period, whether it's Maimonides or Ibn Ezra, 
Moshe Chaim Lutzato or Joseph B. Soloveitchik or Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, all of these great rabbinic thinkers addressed the issue of whether we find evidence of God's uh, design in nature, and they are unanimous in prompting us to expect such evidence. One of the most grossly misrepresented Jewish thinkers in, on this particular issue is Maimonides. So you have someone like Leon Wieseltier, who's the literary editor of the New Republic, who wrote a piece um, not so long ago trying to claim Maimonides as a sort of proto-Darwinist, and he cited um, the famous 25th chapter of the second volume of The Guide of the Perplexed, but he reads only the first part of it and, and really egregiously uh, distorts what Maimonides was saying. What, what, what people like Wieseltier say is that Maimonides was comfortable with any kind of allegorization of creation that, that you want, that you can take allegory as far as you please, and that's not true. When he gets to the end of that chapter, in the Guide of the Perplexed, he says very clearly that there are limits to how much we can fool around with the idea of creation. And he wrote and taught in a context where there was a threat from Aristotelian philosophers who claimed that there was no beginning to the universe, the universe had always existed. And Maimonides said that someone who believes such a thing has made absolute nonsense of the Torah, has undermined completely the basis of the Torah's authority, and he says very clearly, you must understand this. And um, there's a, um, a scholar at the University of Chicago, Joel Kramer, who wrote a very recent and very good biography of Maimonides, where he says that for, for Maimonides, the greatest single uh, theme in his scientific and philosophic writing was the defense of the idea of a creator. And Kramer, a scholar at the University of Chicago who knows what he's talking about, draws, a very, draws an, an explicit parallel to the debate today between Darwinists and advocates of intelligent design. He makes very clear, and he uses the word intelligent design, and makes very clear that Maimonides, were he alive today, would not be on the side of the Darwinists. He would be on the side of the advocates of intelligent design. Jewish defenders of Darwinism also will often cite a rabbi from the 19th century, Samson Raphael Hirsch, uh, as supposedly uh, a supporter of, of evolution because he did, in fact, write very reasonably that Judaism can uh, make peace with the idea of a universe that is billions of years old. Hirsch did not make peace, however, with Darwinism and its moral implications in particular. And he writes about this in his Torah commentary, the, where he writes about the book of Numbers and the image of the idol of Baal Peor, which was uh, worshipped in a terrible uh, animalistic way. And Hirsch says very clearly that this is a parallel to Darwinism today, which lowers a person to the level of an animal. So he was very clear on the moral threat of Darwinian thinking. In classical rabbinic literature, in the Talmud, there's a, a name for a heretic that comes up over and over again. It's called an apikoros. Literally, it means an epicurean. Um, in the Talmud, it says that such a person has no share in the world to come, meaning has no share in the blessing of an afterlife following death. And what's so serious about that? Uh, well, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, who wrote a famous theological um, disputation uh, called the Kuzari, defined an Epicurean, a, an Apicorus, as someone who denies the evidence of God's creativity in nature. That's, this, is, this is the classic um, word, the classic concept for a heretic in Judaism. So it's a very serious thing to take the side of Epicurus, the great um, ancient Greek philosopher, who said that nature is governed by an entire, entirely material process uh, governed by chance, that is the very opposite of what Judaism says. There's a tremendous parallel between this idea in Judaism of, a, of an epic, Epicurus, an Epicurean, a heretic on the one hand, and Darwinian atheism today. And one of the aphorisms in the Mishnah, uh, in a tractate called Pirkei Avot, the chapter of, chapters of the Fathers, says that we are obliged to know how to answer an Epicurus 
We have to know how to refute a heretic. And so Jews are under a very serious obligation today to know how to respond intelligently to an atheist, to a Darwinian, to a modern day Epicurean. A great, a great theme of um, Jewish thought in whether liturgy, scripture, philosophy, is the reciprocal love between God and ourselves. But the question is very reasonably put, put how can, a, how can a, a frail mortal arouse his love of God? And Maimonides in the Mishnah Torah, which is his um, encyclopedic treatment of Jewish law and Jewish thought, says the most accessible path to arousing your love of God is through the contemplation of the evidence of God's creativity in nature. Now, that's the way to do this very basic thing, to, to love God. But Darwinism tells us that there is no such root. There is no evidence of God's creativity in nature. And so therefore, that root is closed to us. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.